Tonight's tough question is going to be not nearly as controversial as last week's, but much more important. And that is uh, the statement that Jesus made on the cross. Uh, I did a series years and years ago in which I did all seven of the sayings Jesus spoke when he was being crucified. And this one is by far the hardest one. Um, and it's given a lot of people trouble. It's caused a lot of people uh, to wrestle with their faith. What did Jesus mean when he said that? So let's read the scripture first, Matthew 27, 45 through 49. It says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, that is from noon until three. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just as a little parenthesis, that language that Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is Aramaic, which was the language that Jesus and his disciples spoke, the language that was spoken in, that, in the Middle East at that time. And normally, it, a lot of people don't realize this, the Bible is translated, the, the people who wrote the Bible, the, Matthew in this case, spoke Aramaic, but he translated it into Greek because that's what was spoken in the wider Western world at the time. But there are sometimes, like here, where he leaves the original Aramaic words. And this time we know why. Because he wants to explain why there was confusion about what Jesus said at the time. And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. See, he, the Eli, Eli, they thought he was saying Elijah, Elijah. The reason why they thought that is there was a, a tradition within Judaism that Elijah, the prophet, would show up when the Messiah came. Or that you could call on Elijah when you were in trouble and he would come help you. All right, so enough explanation from me. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. So I want you to imagine that there's a, a tribe in a far off place in the world cut off and isolated from all civilization, don't really know anything that's going on in the wider world. And they live in terrible conditions, not enough food, not enough water, rampant disease. I want you to imagine a group of Christians finds out about these people and decide, well, let's bring them over here where they can have enough of everything. And so they put them on a plane and they fly them to the United States and they find them homes and they find them jobs and they get them assimilated into American life. Now, you and I would say those people have just gone from darkness to light, from death to life, and they have. Imagine that some of the people would say, I'm just thankful that I'm here. I don't care how I got here. I'm not curious about it. I don't need to know how I got here. I just, all I know is I was in death and now I'm in life, and I'm thankful for it. All I know is there was this day when these people took us to this big building and we walked down this long, narrow hallway, and we sat in these little chairs that were on this long metal tube, and that metal tube all of a sudden shook and, and made all kinds of noise, and then several hours later, we were here in this wonderful place. That's all I know. I don't want to know anything else. But then there are others in the group who say, well, I do want to know. How did this happen? What, what was it that carried me here? And so they, they're taken to the airport where they watch airplanes take off and land, and they, they start to get an understanding. Oh, it's in these things, these metal things, they fly. Okay, well, I don't know how that works. So some of them say, well, can someone explain this to me? And they sit down with a pilot and an aeronautical engineer and they share the, with them some of the principles. They still can't completely grasp it, but they're starting to understand more and they want to know more. So that's kind of a crude ex uh, analogy for salvation. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you trust him with your heart and soul, if you come to a point in life where you say, I've done it myself long enough, Jesus come and take control, forgive me of my sins and, and, and be my savior, you're saved. And it doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how many theological concepts you can, you can explain or understand. We're not saved based on our brain power or our knowledge. We're, ba we're saved based on God's grace. And there are some Christians who never get beyond knowledge-wise that level, that salvation level. All I know is I prayed the prayer and I was sincere and therefore I believe that my God has accepted me. But there are other Christians, and this is who I hope, where I hope you are, who say, no, I want to know more. I want to know more about my Savior. I want to know more about why He saved me. I want to know more about what it took to save me. I want to know what happened on the cross. 
It's not enough for me just to know that I'm saved. I'm glad. I'm thankful for that. But I want to know what was happening on top of Mount Calvary on that Good Friday. And it's important, if you want to know that, it's important to wrestle with this saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because there are all kinds of uh, incorrect beliefs about that saying. Some people read it and think, well, Jesus got, he, he got discouraged and he gave up on God at that moment. Is that really the case? What was actually going on at the cross, this, this saying tells us at least three things about what was going on at the cross. It, it tells us, number one, that at that moment he was separated from his father. So John 17, 20 through 24, we, we read that a few weeks ago in uh, Sunday morning church, but I want to read it for you again. This is the prayer Jesus was praying right before he was arrested. Well, not right before, but in the upper room with the disciples before they went up on the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane. And he prayed for us. He said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, it's easy for us to understand what Jesus is praying there. He's praying that we would love one another. And that's what I preached on a few weeks ago from this passage. That much is easy to understand. What's hard to understand is how he says, you loved me before the foundation of the world and you and I are one. This is, here we get into the concept of the Trinity, which I tried to talk about two weeks ago in the, from this very room. And I doubt any of you went home and said, okay, I've got it now. Well, you know, Jeff talked about it for about 20 minutes now. I, I understand the Trinity completely. If you did, well, then that was a Holy Spirit-inspired work because I don't understand it. God was using an imperfect vessel, but I doubt that you do. I've never met a person who completely understands the Trinity. I shared with you back then that, that my, my daughter, back when she was a little girl, said, well, you're my dad, and you're my mom's husband, and you're my pastor, so you're three people, but you're one. And that's good, but that's not a completely perfect analogy, because I, as, as Kaylee's pastor, I don't have a conversation with Kaylee's dad. Or if I do, there's real problems, right? Um, so... So this idea that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three and distinct, and yet there is only one God. And so uh, Jesus here prays to his Father, and yet the Father and Son are one. Jesus talks about we've had a love between us since the beginning of time, since before uh, creation. How does that work if there's only one God, and yet there's a relationship there? There's a love that exists. We cannot explain that, and yet it's true. You have to accept that to understand what Jesus is saying when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So uh, Douglas Webster wrote a book called In Debt to Christ. I've not read the book, but I've read this quote. At the birth of the Son of God, of God, there was brightness at midnight. At the death of the Son of God, there was darkness at noon. He's referring to the fact that there was darkness from noon to three in the afternoon on the day Jesus died. So for the three hours leading up to his death, the sun was nowhere to be seen, and there was darkness in the middle of the day. And I submit to you that was the Father grieving. That was the Father saying, I will not look on this. The Father was hurting, and the Son was hurting. It's even prefigured in Amos 8. Amos 8, 9 through 10. And on that day declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth at broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Now, like most prophecies in the Old Testament, there was a fulfillment that was for that time when Amos was writing. He was talking about these Israelites who were so high and mighty and, and living in their paneled houses, and their, inlaid, their houses laid, inlaid with ivory. But he said, you're going to pay the consequences of your actions, and on that day it's going to be miserable for you. Yes, that applied to back then, but like so many prophecies in the Old, in the Old Testament, it also looked forward to a second fulfillment, and that was this day of Jesus' death. Why else would he say the sun will be, will be uh, down at noon? Why else would he say it will be like a day of mourning for an only son. The darkness that day was God's grief. At the same time, Jesus was crying out, 
Why have you forsaken me? He had truly been God forsaken. There was a rupture between father and son. And you might say, well, big deal. That was only for a few hours. I've been separated from a loved one who died decades ago. And yet, I don't think we can understand what it means for father and son to be ruptured. Because think about it this way. What do we call it when you are separated from God? That's hell. What is hell? Hell is separation from God. It is being cut off from God and His love and everything good that He gives. None of us has ever experienced that. Hopefully none of us ever will. If you're in Christ, you won't. But Jesus did. Jesus did experience that. So that is one reason for the cry. Another thing that was happening there is the righteous one became sin. Now we say very easily, Jesus died for my sins. That's what was happening at the cross. Jesus died for my sins. Uh, When I'm trying to explain that to people, I will say, well, it's like uh, you've committed a crime and you're on death row. And an innocent man comes forward and says, let me go to the death chamber in his place. When I'm explaining the gospel to children during VBS week, Last few years, I've used the same analogy. I've said, imagine that on the last day of school when report cards are getting ready to go out, you know that you failed a class and the smartest kid in school comes up to you and says, hey, let's trade report cards. You take my A and I'll take your F. And you say, but you're going to be punished. Your parents are going to be mad at you. And he says, that's okay. I can handle it. You, you go ahead and take my A. And I always ask the kids, would you take that? Would you take that deal? And some of them think, Is this a trick question? Am I going to get in trouble for this? But I say, no, no, listen. Would you rather have the A or the F? Oh, we'd rather have the A. And they understand. And I say, that's what Jesus did for us. We earned an F by our lives. Jesus earned an A. He's the only human being who ever earned an A. The only one who ever lived a perfect, sinless life. And yet he traded report cards with us. I don't get into death with children that age, but that's something they can grasp. And all that's great. But the truth is even deeper than just a a substitution and Jesus dying for our sins because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that means that on that cross, Jesus didn't just become guilty of our sin, he became our sin. Now, I don't know how that's possible. I don't even know all that that means, but the Bible is very clear about it, that Jesus became sin for us. I think about it this way. Think about whatever it is in this world that you hate the most. Uh, For a lot of us, it would be a disease like cancer. I think we've all lost someone close to us to that disease. Just listen as Merle reads our prayer, prayer list every week. How many people are struggling with cancer? Wouldn't that be the thing you would eliminate from this world if you could? Now imagine that God said the only way you can eliminate cancer is if you become cancer. And how awful that would be to be, to know that I am the thing that has destroyed so many lives. And that's what happened to Jesus. He went from righteous, not just from righteous to sinful, he went from righteous to sin itself. He went from life to the source of death. He chose that in order to kill it, in order to destroy it. He entered into sin, he became sin so that he could destroy it from the inside. And so that also is a reason why I believe he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then third, he suffered the wrath that we deserved. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. It is no accident that Jesus was crucified. There are all kinds of ways Jesus could have died. The Jewish Sanhedrin could have taken him out and stoned him to death. We see them do that to Stephen just a few weeks later. But they had him crucified. And they had their reasons. They wanted the sanction of the Roman government. They wanted to be able to say to Jesus' friends and followers, well, it wasn't our fault. You know, Rome, was, Rome will do what Rome will do. They wanted Jesus to be seen as an enemy of the people. They had their reasons, and yet God had his reasons. Think about all the times in the Gospels when people pick up stones to kill Jesus or when the members of his own hometown drag him to the edge of a cliff to throw him off and kill him that way. All the times Jesus' life was spared, saved for this moment. Why? It had to be the cross. It had to be the cross. 
because cursed is anyone who is hung upon a tree. Cursed means literally God forsaken. Cursed by God means you are cut off from the Almighty. And Jesus was suffering the wrath we deserve. Now here's an even more uh, hard scripture to read, and that's Romans 3, 25 through 26. Speaking of Jesus, it said, whom God put forward as a propitiation, propitiation is the word, as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That word propitiation is not a word we use anymore, but it means to satisfy a debt. To satisfy a debt. Imagine uh, you are working and you get done with work a little early. You get in your car and you back your car out and you slam right into your boss's car. I mean, just slam into it, not a little dent. You're in trouble, right? And you want to drive away and never come back. But you know you need your job. So what can you do? Well, if you're smart, you're going to go to your boss and say, here's what I did. And I will pay back every penny of what it costs to repair your car. Will you please forgive me? That's offering propitiation. That is acknowledging, I did this. I'm responsible. I will pay. That's propitiation. And hopefully your your boss will accept that. Right? The wrong thing to do would be to drive away and think, oh, well, he'll never know. And then to find out that one of your coworkers saw it or that there's a, a security camera that's filming it. Right? Then you're really in trouble. Well, propitiation in a spiritual sense is that Jesus paid the price. See, unlike in my analogy, I mean, I think most of us, if we really tried, we could find a way to pay back our boss for the damage to his car. Even if it was a couple of thousand, we'd find a way to get that money. We might have to borrow from someone else. We might have to work overtime, but we'd do it. But our debt before the Lord was such that we could not pay it. It was infinite. Jesus, in his, one of his parables, compares it to uh, so much money before a king that it would take lifetimes to pay off. And yet Jesus was paying that debt for us. Not, and that's just one person. He was paying the debt for all of us. Every single person. He was offering, he was suffering the wrath we deserved. Now, there are some people who really don't like this doctrine. And I'll admit, some people have preached it the wrong way. They've preached it to say, well, God was really angry at us and he couldn't forgive us unless someone died in our place. Well, I don't think that's the case because God loves us. God found a way to save us. And this was the way. See, they make it sound like, well, the cross changed God's mind. God's mind has never been changed. God never felt any differently about you before or after. His love for you has been constant. It's just that a debt had to be paid, and he chose to pay it himself. But then people come back and they say, I just don't understand. If God wanted to forgive us so badly, why didn't he just forgive us? After all, if somebody steps on my toe, I'm just told to forgive them, not to require them to pay some price. Yes, but think about this. I'll give you two examples of of why this wrath is justified. So remember years ago when we were when our nation was hunting Osama bin Laden. Hunting him and hunting him, and finally SEAL Team 6 caught him and took him out, and we all rejoiced. But what if the president, before that ever happened, had said, you know what, let's just write this off. Mr. Bin Laden, you are free of of any and all responsibility to our nation. I know you did a terrible thing, but we're a merciful people, and I'm a merciful man, so you just go on about your business. We will not hunt you. We will not arrest you. We will not seek retribution of any kind. Would we have rejoiced at that or, we, or would we have been incensed? I think that would have been something that would have gotten all of us up in arms, wouldn't it? Because Not because we're cruel and, and, and horrible people, but because we all have an innate sense of justice. When you're responsible for the deaths of thousands of people, a price has to be paid. And we acknowledge that. So, Here's a, here's a more simple example. Go back to the example of backing into your boss's car in the parking lot. Your boss could, if you came and threw yourself at his mercy and said, I will pay you back every penny, he could say, you know, it's really no big deal. Uh, it's just a car. You're a valuable employee. Don't you worry one bit about it. That'd be nice of him, wouldn't he? 
and yet a price would still have to be paid. Someone would have to pay. His insurance agent, but we all know how that works, right? There's still a deductible. So forgiveness is never free. Someone has to pay something. At the cross, Jesus was paying the debt for all of us. The debt that we owed to the Lord himself. Because every sin we commit is an offense, not just against the person we committed against, but against the Lord himself. And Jesus was God's way of paying that debt for us. And people who can't accept this idea, part of the problem is they underestimate the seriousness of our sin. You know, when I talk about bin Laden, they go, oh yeah, obviously, but my sins aren't on that level. Well, theologically speaking, they are. The lies that I told when I was a little boy and just was trying to get out of trouble or the times that I made fun of someone who didn't look like me or even now my, my laziness or my uh, selfishness or my grumpiness or whatever <laughs> sin you want to throw at me. It's just as damaging to the moral fiber of the universe. It's just as damaging and offensive to God as murder. And you see that in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus talks about it. Lust is the same as adultery. Hatred is the same as murder, you see? You underestimate the seriousness of your sin if you don't think it takes uh, such a, an act as crucifixion to pay for your sin. At the same time, we also, if we can't accept this idea, we underestimate the oneness of the Father and the Son. And we say things like, well, the cross is like uh, heavenly child abuse. No, it's not, because God the Father and God the Son are one. It's not like God the Father is this mean dad who's, abusing his child. God the Father and God the Son are one. So what Jesus suffered on the cross, the entire God had suffered. God was, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And again, to go back to Romans 3, he was both just and the justifier. He found a way to destroy sin and at the same time rescue us. It's the only way it could have happened. It was an ingenious plan. Unfortunately, was a terrible plan for God because the only reward he got was us. See, the, the misunderstanding that I, I spoke of earlier when people say, well, it, it sounds like Jesus has given up on God when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What you don't understand when you say that is Jesus is quoting scripture. He's quoting Psalm 22. And I'm sure all of you've read Psalm 22. But if it's been a while, I want to read you portions of that right now. It, it begins with those words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. This is a psalm of David. He's writing during a time like so often when he felt abandoned by God and he spoke it. He didn't just keep it to himself. He went to the Father with his groaning. And you get down to verse 14. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, keep in mind that when David wrote this, no one had even thought of crucifixion at the time. That punishment had not been invented yet. And yet David speaks of piercing hands and feet. I, this is just my opinion. I don't think David knew that God was using him to foretell the crucifixion of the Messiah. I think David was just writing his thoughts down on paper because that was how he came to his father with his pain. And the Holy Spirit in his sovereignty gave him words that would be used for the rest of us to understand that God had this planned all along. That's just my opinion. But isn't it amazing? He speaks of pierced hands and feet. He speaks of dividing the garments among them and casting lots. This is, a, this is a direct prophecy of what Jesus would experience. And then look at how it ends. This is, this is where the, the prophecy turns. Verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. That is the beginning of a transition in Psalm 22. Up till then, first 21 verses have all been about suffering. And Lord, where are you? 
And why are you allowing this into my life? And if you've ever suffered, you know how that feels. You may not have spoken words like that, but you probably felt them. And then in verse 22, everything changes and suddenly the psalmist is hopeful. Suddenly he says, hey, I'm going to praise you in the assembly of the, of the righteous. I'm going to tell everybody how great you are. And the last words of the psalm are, because he has done it. So for ten, the last 10 verses are all about praising God. Now keep something in mind. The Psalms were the hymn book of Israel. If I say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, do you know what line comes next? That saved a wretch like me. You know the next line, right? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I mean, you know these songs. You were raised with these songs. Jesus and the people he grew up with were raised with the Psalms as their songs. So for Jesus to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anyone who actually listened I'm not talking about the people who just said, oh, he's calling Elijah. I mean, anybody who really listened would go, oh, that's Psalm 22. And they would start to put it together in their minds. They wouldn't think he was crying out in a, in a cry of abandonment. They would say, he believes he's going to survive. He believes he's going to live to praise God because that's the way the psalm ends. They would understand. They would already have that tune in their mind. Jesus Yes, he is, he is proclaiming the fact that right now I am separated from my Father. Right now I am I'm feeling the wrath that is justifiably against every evil deed that has ever been done. But there will be another day when I will rise again and I will praise the Lord and, and millions will come to Him through me. So let me just close with this. In November... 22nd, 1963, there was a, a play going on in England, just a little theater. And in the play, there was a man on stage who was, pretend, who was portraying a worker at his desk. And he was doing work, and there was a transistor radio playing, live radio, while he was doing his work. And all of a sudden, a, a news flash came on the radio and said, Bulletin, the American president, John F. Kennedy, has been assassinated today. And there was this gasp in the audience. And the actor reached up and turned off the radio, but it was too late. You know, when you go to a play or a movie, you sort of suspend reality for a while. You forget about what's going on in real life, and you're just entered into the story that you're watching. But that was destroyed. At that moment, everyone in that theater wasn't thinking about the story on the stage. They were thinking, what just happened in America? And I tell you that to say, we live in a world where we look around and we think certain things are reality. We, start, we, we think day-to-day -day life is as real as it gets, and yet we read Jesus' words from the cross and we realize things that have happened 2,000 years ago are actually more important than what happened today on the news. The words of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, tell us that the most important thing that ever happened in your life happened thousands of miles away, the other side of the world, on a hilltop where a man was crucified for your sin. And it changes your reality when you start to see the world that way. No matter what happens tomorrow, it won't change the fact that God loved you enough to die for you. It won't change the fact that your sins are completely paid for. It won't change the fact that there is nothing and never will be anything between God and you. And it won't change the fact that you have been given His righteousness once and for all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, these are things that we can't completely understand, and that's okay as long as we believe them, as long as we know that they are true. We understand enough. We understand enough to know that you love us more than we could ever possibly imagine and certainly more than we deserve. And yet, Lord, that love has transformed us. We're not just beggars uh, who found bread. We're children of the King. You've made us that, and we rejoice in that. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would daily live in the shadow of the cross, not so that it would bring us shame, but so that it would fill us with freedom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.